making a total of eight utensils. The question is, what's the, the likelihood, basically probability, of getting two of the same utensils? So we have these, these, these eight objects. So that means we're gonna have our total out of eight for the first thing we grab. So what's the chance that um, I'm gonna grab, for example, a spoon? Four out of eight. Four out of eight. Now when I pick up that, okay, so say I pick, so say I pick up that spoon. What's left? What's going to be the total out of? Seven. Seven. Perfect. I'm um, sorry, I'm having a trouble putting. Um, Trevor, you mind helping me out? I'm having a trouble with putting this one into words. Absolutely. Yeah. So, so um, the the hint on this is uh, is really kind of nice uh, in in the fact that uh, it's a good way to think about it and. We're saying, okay, so what's the probability that basically the second uh, utensil we pick up is a is the same as the first? So, um, do you want me to share my screen? Uh, uh, here, I'll, I'll show how I kind of looked at this one. Oh yeah, go for it. So we know that we had uh, four spoons. People see that? Cool. And four forks. So, so there's two different ways we can look at this. So, so um, on my first pick and my second pick. Well, on the first pick, I can get either a spoon or a fork. But it doesn't matter which one I get because all that matters is that my second pick matches the first. So I can either get a spoon or a fork here, and I can get a spoon or a fork here. So the ones that I care about is this top one and this bottom one. So we need to talk about what the probability is. So, so if I have four, four spoons and four forks, I draw one spoon, I have three spoons remaining, and four forks remaining. So then when I come over here, I say, what's the probability of drawing another spoon? Well, that's going to be, uh, I only have three spoons left out of my total utensils, which is seven. So the, if I draw a spoon first, then the probability is three sevenths. So now let's consider the case uh, when we do the forks. So if we go down here, we say, okay, I, I left the spoon, I drew a fork. So I have three forks remaining and kind of same idea. I have three forks out of the remaining seven utensils. So either way, my probability is the same. Did that make sense? Any questions on that before I stop sharing my screen? Maybe I should ask that. Yes, oh my gosh. So you said that there was two ways of doing it. Um, do you mind showing us another way possibly? Maybe with oh, numbers cool. one? So, um, okay. Uh, and I would say like, this is a nice way to kind of graphically show it out. But um, the, the hint was that, okay, so what is the probability that, um, that you get kind of two of the same utensil? Well, it doesn't matter what we get on the first utensil. So probability of two utensils the same equals the probability that the second utensil matches the first. So let's see. So 
so so um it's hard because this one is it seems it seems to me like this one is more kind of logically like playing with that hint um I'm trying to determine I, I i don't think there is a general like mathematical uh rule for for uh kind of figuring this one out it's knowing okay it doesn't matter what you get on the first utensil but we know that our second utensil for it to match the first um there's always just going to be seven left in the denominator because we had uh we had basically eight utensils minus the one that we took gives us seven and then um and then no matter which one we pick and it'll be the same on the exam it was the same in the homework uh since these numbers are the same it doesn't matter which one you you took since you already took one of them out it's going to be oh sorry it's going to be there was four minus the one so either way you'll get the the three out of seven I, I i'm sorry I, I hope that like helps to answer any other questions on this one this one was for sure tricky yeah i didn't know how to put that one into words like <laughs> i'm still for, I, i'm still having trouble putting it to words did, thanks did, for backing did me up have any other questions on that like i want you guys to let me know because that I just, can keep trying. okay i just want to clarify because my numbers weren't four like each they were five um okay. but i kind of tried to do what you were saying um i put it five over ten because that's how it starts. And then actually what you just showed was minus one each, and then I got four over nine. That would be correct, right? Yes, absolutely, okay. that would be correct. Cool, and yeah, I know sometimes you get different numbers. It has, uh, it, it gives different numbers for kind of different people. So uh, let us know if, if you wanna run your ideas by us for your specific numbers. I think that's always a good thing. Cool, I'm glad it makes sense. To yeah, any other questions on this one before we uh, keep moving on? And all questions are good questions. I will not, I will, I will continue to stress the importance of questions. We want to help you guys out. Okay, perfect. Yes, no, no. Um, would that event be dependent? Yes, because it would depend on what you got first. Okay, and I actually have a question for the one that we did before. What would it be, independent or dependent? The one we did before, number three? Yes. Mm. Oh, I think that one's just independent. Okay, thank you. Well, in terms of like what, what I'm grabbing out the bag in terms of the jelly beans. Thank you. It's kind of like, it's kind of randomly, it's independent. Like if I stick my hand, it's, independent of what I'm grabbing like there's it doesn't depend on anything because it's kind of a random grab okay so I'm gonna share my screen again okay can everyone see that yeah perfect so we are on number five okay it has been reported that 70.8 percent of the earth's surface is covered by water 5.8 percent is agricultural land and 23.4 percent is other land if a meteor lands at some random point on the surface of the earth what is the probability that the meteor does not land on the agricultural land okay so if any everyone could write this down so we have so we specific, so it's asking specifically about what is the probability that the meteor does not come down on the agricultural land. So since it's focusing on ag agricultural land, I'm going to just focus on that percentage, which is 5.8. I'm going to share my iPad now really quick so you guys can see the process. But yeah, just keep note of um, like what it's kind of what the questions are kind of indicating. So we have this 5.8% of agricultural land, and it's asking us what's the likelihood that it doesn't hit that agricultural land. So does, an, does anyone kind of know what this is getting at? So you just um, subtract uh, 5.8 from 100? Correct. So we have this 100% because all these percentages it provided us add up to 100. And it's asking us the probability of not 
hitting the agricultural land. So basically all the other percentage is right here in that 100. So we're gonna subtract 5.8% from 100, or you can also do one minus 0.58 if you prefer decimals. And when you subtract that, does anyone, can anyone, or my, my bad, I made a mistake. 0 0.058, because we have to move that decimal twice to the left. Does anyone know what that gives us? 94.2%. Perfect. Does everyone understand that one? If you'd like to go over it, just unmute yourself and let me know or chat me. Um, can you just go over it? Like, let's say um, with everything, like if you were doing the whole subtraction, like the carrying and everything. Okay. So we have 1.00 minus 0 0.058. I'm going to add an extra zero just as a placement holder. But but you guys understand how I got 0 0.508, right? Because when we're converting um, percentages to decimal, we're going to want to move that decimal over twice. So that's how I got 0 0.058, just to clarify. So now what we're going to do is we're going to want to essentially um, so we have zero right here, so we can't subtract anything. So we're going to cancel that out. We can't take anything from the next number because it's also zero. So we cancel that one out as well. And we're going to cancel this one out because it's not going to give us anything. So we'll, we finally have this one here. So we're going to turn this into a zero. We're going to have a nine right here. A nine right here because we can't take anything, but we're going to have a 10 at the top. So now if I run this down, I'm going to run, throw my decimal down as well. 10 minus 8, what is that? So I'm going to shout it out. 2. Perfect. 9 minus 5? That's 4. 9 minus 0? 9. Perfect. And now to turn that back to percentage, we're going to run that decimal over, to, over twice. So then now that's how we get 94.2%. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you. Um, yes, that makes sense. Just for like the 100, I saw that you added another zero. Is that just for placeholder? That's just uh, my preference because that's like my brain. Like, I don't know. I like to see, I, I don't like it when it's kind of just empty. So we had that 058. I don't like how that looks. So I just add a zero there because technically if I have one, it's technically 1.000. It's just one, but I just added that zero there just as a visual so I can see um, what's going on. And, to, and I like to cross out my, my zeros or my numbers as I'm going along. And if you, if you don't want to add it, uh, additional placeholder, you, um, you don't have to if you could do it in your head, but um, I do it just so I could visualize it. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Couldn't you just uh, subtract the two uh, the two uh, numbers as as they were since they were like uh, fractions? I mean, um, percentages. Yeah, you can do that as well. Definitely, if you don't want to. Um, yeah, you can do that. That works out. Okay. Okay. So, number six. So the blank of a person who doesn't who does have the disease. Did you guys hear me? I think I'm having here. You kind of broke up, but I can hear you. So I it's step in if you're if you're having. I think my internet's back, but if it goes down, I'll let you know again. Okay, so, um, so this is kind of a de just a, a definition. Um, if you guys like visualize the the definition or like know the definitions, then I'm, I'm sure you guys can guess this one. Does anyone have the answer? And does anyone want to shout it out? Sensitivity. Sensitivity. Yeah. And Joel, what, Joel, why do you think that's sensitivity? It's because that they're sensible to the disease. So like they have a higher chance of getting it or if that makes sense. Exactly. The person who does have the disease. Perfect. Does anyone need a further explanation? Okay, 
not or uh, if you guys are shy just chat me and then I, i'll text you the explanation or trevor can also um help with that as well also um another tutor is here named ruben um he can uh help help you guys out as well if you guys want to message him privately as well okay so moving on to number seven the following table gives the results of a screening test for disease estimate the sensitivity of the test round your answer your answer if necessary to one decimal Okay, so let me share my screen. Okay. So we know that it's giving us um, it's giving us essentially the people who have the disease and do not have the disease, the people who, and the people who test positive, the people who test negative who have the disease and do not have the disease as well. So what's the sensitivity? What am I going to be looking for? A over G or A over A plus C. And for the students who don't know what that means, can you clarify? What is isn't it? it the ones that have like true positive? Perfect, yes, the true positive. So we have our true positives and what number is that? That's 33. Perfect. And for people who um, didn't understand, so true positives are, if I'm testing positive and I, am, and I actually have the disease, that's true. I tested positive and I actually have it. So that's why it's kind of called a true positive. Um, and that number is 33, as you guys can see. So we have 33, as our true positives or AKA our sensitivity. But so now what's my next step if I wanna find the sensitivity? Does anyone have an idea? Find the total number of people who have the disease? Correct, exactly. So how many people have the disease? What, am I, what two numbers am I gonna add up? 33 and 22. Correct, because I'm, I'm adding up the people essentially everyone who has a disease and that's going to fall under this column 33 20 22 and what is that going to give me 55 perfect so that means or for everyone who wants to see that we have our sensitivity is essentially going to be 33 over 55 but we have to convert that to a percentage so if I have, so eventually, or essentially to do that, we want to see how many times. Um, do you multiply it by 100? Um, I might have done that wrong. Yeah, I don't think you multiply it by 100. Um, essentially, yeah, 33 by 55 is it like that or is it like i think it's like this. I, I i think it's yeah it's 55 divided on the 33 on the inside perfect exactly so <laughs> these ones are kind of hard for me to be honest ruben do you want to run uh do you have an ipad to share let me just sync it really quick give me one minute okay Sorry, it's because I have trouble doing it by hand. Um, I typically use a calculator. <laughs> yeah, I, I, can, uh, I can jump in for this one. I okay. Cool. So, okay, cool, cool, cool. So we are trying to do, so we have, oh, that's yellow still. <laughs> so we have 33 over 55. So one way to remind myself how this works is I always go uh, like four over two and say, okay, well, I know that that equals two. And the way that I uh, remind myself long division wise is the top number goes on the inside and the bottom number goes over here. So then I divide and I say, okay, so two goes into four twice, so forth. So easy example. Now let's apply it to this one. So for 33 over 55, we say, okay, top number goes inside and the 55 goes on the outside. We have a decimal point here. 
So now we say, okay, so 55 obviously can't go into 33, it's smaller. So we put a decimal point on the top and we add a zero. So now we ask ourselves, okay, how many times does 55 go into uh, 330? And how many times does it do that? Six times. Six times, let's try six. Let's see if it works. Six times five is 30. And, uh, and six times five is again 30. So making this 33. So this cancels out completely. If we get a zero on bottom, then that is just gonna be it in general. So 33 over 55 is gonna be 0.6. And as a percent, like, uh, like uh, uh, Chris always says, is move that decimal point twice over. So we're gonna get 60% on that one. And oh my gosh, that was like not neat work at all. I'm so sorry. Does anyone have any questions? Oh, could we simplify it to three over five? Yes, you could. That is so smart. <laughs> yes, uh, I see something in the chat and I definitely wanna mention. That's so funny. Uh, everyone does things uh, different ways, but this is probably the best way to do it. So good job, guys. Uh, 33 over 55, we could divide the top and bottom. Oh, sorry. We, we can say, okay, what number goes into both 33 and 55? Since they're doubles like that, that's going to be 11. So we can divide the top by 11 and the bottom by 11, which equals, so 33 divided by 11 is 3. 55 divided by 11 is 5. 3 out of 5 is much easier to deal with. Uh, and in, if you wanted to, uh, to make it even, uh, well, either way, <laughs> that equals 0.6. Good job, guys. Do you always move the decimal place twice? Yes, when you are transitioning from, uh, from uh, uh, decimal to percent, you, only, you, you move it twice every time. Good question. And I will give it back to Chris. Thanks for helping me out on that one. Yeah, no, absolutely. That's why I'm here. Yeah. Okay, guys. So um, moving on to number eight, I think. Yes. So suppose that a certain HIV test has both a sensitivity and specificity of 99%. This test is applied to a population of, of 10,000. Uh, 10,000 drug rehabilitation patients, 13% of whom are actually infected with HIV. How many people will test positive who are in fact disease free? Second question, which quantity was the answer to the first part of this problem? So um, let's cover B really quick since it's more of a conceptual question. So it's asking which quantity uh, was the answer to, answer to the first part of this problem? So it's, it, does anyone know the answer? I said S. You said S? Yeah, when I did my thingy. Okay, so S is actually going to be um, the totals. And it's at the quantity. So the answer in this question is asking the people who test are the people who will test positive who are in fact disease free. The E? Is it B? It's B. B. True negative. B, yeah. Yeah, B. B? Perfect. Yeah. So whoever said B is correct. Um, whoever said B, do you want to explain really quick on why you think to the class on, on your logic? Well, B is asking um, who's disease-free that tested positive, and B is the only part that apl really applies to that because it's falling under does not have disease and testing positive. Exactly. So exactly like she said, um, it, it, it may be a bit confusing. It's not S because S is a total. So if this question were asking what's the total of um, everything, then yes, it would be S, but it's actually asking the people who test positive. Can you guys see my pointer on the yeah. screen? Okay. Yeah. So the people who test positive, but who are in fact disease free do not have the disease and that's going to be B. Okay, and then, okay, so like, and that's because it asks you like, what's the answer or which quantity was the answer to the first part of the problem? Correct. Yeah, so it's, it's basically referring to this first question. I just wanted to go over this one um, first because it's it's more of a logical or conceptual answer. Okay. But yes. That makes sense. Perfect. Okay, so now this, the first question is actually asking how many people will test positive who 
who are in fact disease free. So let me stop sharing so I can share my iPad. So this one's gonna be more of a, a math uh, a math one. Okay, so test positive, but disease free. So we know that 10,000 people have the disease, correct? So we know our total is 10,000. People who have it. And we also know that 13% are actually infected with HIV. So we know the people um, who are infected is 13%. So does anyone have an idea of how we would find the amount of people who are infected? Multiply those together. Perfect. So we're going to multiply. So before we multiply, we're going to want to convert this into a decimal. So 13% times 10,000. Does anyone know what that would give us? 1,300. Perfect. 1,300. And, and so to, to find out how many people who will test positive or in fact have the disease, we also find, have to find the people who do not have the disease. So if I found out that 1,300 people have the disease because it says 13% are actually infected, what, what do you think I would do to find the people who are not infected? Subtract it. <laughs> Perfect. So we're just gonna subtract. And what is that gonna give us? 8,700. And it's asking us basically essentially for the false positives, the people who test positive and who actually do not have the disease. So, we're gonna try to, um, or it's, it's 8,700, correct? So we can do 8,700. <laughs> My bad, I'm getting stuck here. <laughs> Um, you want to jump in? Yeah. Cool. Um, so basically, uh, you, you're trying to find out uh, how many people who test positive who are in fact disease free. So what we just found was the total of people who don't have the disease. So now, um, so do you want me to take it from here? <laughs> Yeah, let me share my screen real quick. And actually, let me do something. <laughs> Just going to get rid of all that. <laughs> no sneak peeks, guys. So what we determined is that we want the number of false positives, or, or B. Um, we determined that the people who don't have the disease was the 10,000 minus the 1,300 equals 8,700. Right on. So that's where we're at. So, so we notice that what we want so we don't, what we don't know is we don't know the number of total positive and we don't know the number of total negative. That isn't given uh, in the problem. But what we do know is that we have our total here, the 8,700. And we're, so, so now we wanna find out the number of people who tested positive who fall in that group of people. Oh, yes. 
Uh, I see someone asked for the numbers by the letters. So I'll put it, yeah, so this is 1300 is what we know is has disease. And of the people who don't have the disease is the 8700. And that's, oh yeah, and then we also know the 10,000. Cool, good, good thing. Okay, um, so we wanna find, so, so now we're given sensitivity and specificity. So which one are we gonna use? Feel free to just put it in the chat. Sensitivity. So sensitivity is a good guess. What is it? Sensitivity, is that related to the positives or the negatives? Positives. Positives. That, so that, that was a good guess because we're saying, okay, we see that it falls in the positive category, but we don't know the number of total positives. So we want to relate it to something, uh, something that we do know um, because it's, uh, it would be uh, sensitivity. Sensitivity is true positives over has disease. But, um, but we would want, we don't know the number of people who tested positive in total. So when we added A and B, we, we, we don't have anything that it adds up to that we know. So instead of using sensitivity, we want to use the column that uh, it finds uh, the, that this, this part finds itself in. And I see that uh, uh, someone guessed specificity. So the reason the specificity is going to be true negatives over has, does not have disease. And the reason we want to do that is, so we know that this is 99 or 99%. So the reason we want to do that is kind of our, our total. And so total, and this is going to look really weird for a sec, but so total doesn't have disease over doesn't have disease. So if I'm counting for everyone, and I know that looks weird, is equal to the number of true negatives. So if they don't have the disease, I'd hope they'd get a negative true negative over doesn't have disease plus the false positives because because false positives is saying, okay, they have the disease even though they don't. So that also goes into the doesn't have disease. So that would give us our total. So, so the way that we can think about this, we know that that 0.99 of these are our true negatives are 99%. So what percent is gonna be the false positives or the doesn't have, uh, sorry, the false positives in this case? Feel free to put it in the chat. It's kind of a weird idea. Or unmute yourself, that, that works too. I'm taking a guess here, I don't know, is it 0.1? Exactly. Exactly, it's one percent. That okay? I see something in the chat, and we'll talk about that in uh, in a in a sec. Um, uh, yeah. So so yes, it's going to be 0 0.01. So awesome guess. Thank you for guessing, by the way. Um, so ninety nine percent we know were true negatives over the doesn't have the disease. So the other one percent must be false positive. So so when we now that we know that. It's 1% of 8,700, which when we calculate that is what? Oh, I see, I see someone put it in the chat, 87. Move that decimal point. So that actually is gonna be your answer here. So I know that was kind of a weird way to think about that. I, 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 I see, um, Oh, oh, someone said, oh, awesome. So someone uh, said that they got 87 for B and they got 8,613 for D. So uh, I want to mention that really quick because sometimes this extra 1% thing kind of throws people off. So since we know that, um, I might have to, here, I'm going to condense a little bit. 
little song. So just condensing. So since we know the specificity was 99% and we know that we know the number of people who don't have the disease, um, we could solve for the true negative. So our true negative, if we move doesn't, doesn't have to this other side, we know our true negative is going to be uh, the number of people who don't have the disease times 99%. And you would have to do it all by hand because we don't have uh, access to calculators on the exam. And oh, great question. So the fact that it's 90, so it says both sensitivity and specificity are 99%. That's, that's given. It's one of the only, like the big thing that we're given here. And the point one came from the fact we know that uh, we have a total of 100% of people who don't have the disease is going to be the mixture of those who got true negatives and those who got false positives. I think and, one thing that's confusing me is that it says both. Yes, and they do put both to kind of throw you off a little bit. Because sensitivity would, would be helpful. It would help us get A and C in this case, but it wouldn't let us, since we don't know the total positive or total negative, since these remain unknown, it's just in there to throw you off. So the fact that, that, that it's throwing off is, is like, makes sense. It threw me off when I first did this one. So it's saying both means sensitivity and specificity put together is 99%. It's saying that specificity is 90. Oh, I see what you're saying. So specificity is 99% and also sensitivity is 99%. Okay. And... And then, so, so 8,700 times the, the 0.99, your number of true negatives is 8,613. And then you already know the number of people who don't have the disease. So then you could do 8,700 minus the 8,613. So that would become a 10 because you need to borrow. That'd be a nine because you need to borrow. That would become a six, yay, uh, seven, uh, Eight. So you could solve that way. I think the tough part there is you'd have to multiply those by hand, but it's another way to do it. So the extra 1% was more of kind of uh, a shortcut. I think um, that's why I got confused as well, because I would have done it the other way, the one that Michelle, the way Michelle mentioned. Another way you can solve is D over 8,700. Uh, 8, yeah, you, you just did it right now. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, <laughs> Sorry, I had to read it. Okay, yeah, and I did it that way uh, first. I just wanted to, I wanted to show both ways. Does anyone else have any questions on this one? I like this one was the toughest for me personally, so I definitely want to make sure your questions are answered here. So just to oh, go ahead. Sorry. Okay, so my only question, so, okay, I solved it the way where we do 8,700 times 0.99, but I had put the 8,613 where the B was, so I think I'm just confused about the B and D. I'm getting those two mixed up, where I'm putting 87 where D is and 8,613 where the B is, if that makes sense. Yes, uh, that totally makes sense. So, so specificity is given. Specificity is the true negatives over the total who don't have. So true negatives are those who test negative and don't have the disease. So where those line up is D. So then for the answer, when it's asking how many people will test positive who are in fact test disease-free, it would be the 87 then? Yep. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Yeah, what was the other question that was coming in? So for this example, we don't, we don't even have to pay attention to the sensitivity, correct? Since we just need to focus on that one column where B is? Exactly. Yeah. Okay, got it. Yeah, great question. Good clarification. Um, I understand if it will be too confusing to do this, but do you mind like labeling? Like, like first we should do this and then, you know. Uh, sure. I would say, so let me condense this uh, a little more just to include the part that, um, that Chris went over at the beginning. 
So the first thing that we did is we noted that, so, so one thing I like to like underline, I, I guess that you can't really do that online, but the, the pertinent information. So, so, uh, so first we find the number of people who have disease is equal to 13% because that's given or 0.13 times the total population of 10,000. So if I wanted to call this a step, I'd say one, let's see, let's see, let's see. One determine who has the disease and I spelled disease wrong. Then from that, you can determine who doesn't have the disease. So first step is find disease, find number with disease, find number without disease, because you want to determine those totals. Then kind of you need to determine because because they could they could say they could switch it up on you. They could say, what's the number of people who will test negative who are in fact uh, have the disease. So it's kind of determined from the given which, which population we're dealing with. So I definitely want, uh, or what else can we use? So d use sensitivity or specificity. In this specific example though, we use specificity to determine uh, the number of true negatives. And I'm gonna go along with uh, the way that Michelle and Chris did it. So then from, so, so this, is, this is us, this is actually applying step three. And the last step, so once we know the number of true negatives, we know that, it, that the false positives are just going to be, so, so determine number of true negatives. And the last step is, uh, so uh, subtracting, true negatives from those who don't have the disease. Thank you so much. Absolutely. We're happy to help. <laughs> cool. Any other questions on this one before we keep going? And we're going all the way till five, so still have a little bit of time, but we wanna make sure we get to all your guys' questions. Okay, also um, just wanna mention, yeah, we go till five. Um, if you guys still need help, um, STEM Center closes at six o'clock. So um, if you guys are having any trouble with any of these problems, you guys can go ahead and um, try to hit the STEM Center and ask any of the tutors. Um, Great point, thank you, Chris. <laughs> okay, so I'm just gonna share my screen so we can go over the other. Okay, so nine, a bag contains three red cubes, two blue cubes, four red, four red balls, and three blue balls. When you draw a ball, you guys notice how that it says ball in bold? When you draw a ball at random, what is the probability that the color is blue? Okay. Okay, so we have three red cubes. Highlight one second. Three red cubes, two blue cubes, four red, four red balls, and three blue balls. What total is that going to give me? Anyone? Twelve. Yes, twelve. Perfect. So we're getting. So that's. I think that's one of the first steps because um, earlier someone asked what steps should be done first. I think that's the first step for this type of problem. You always want to get your total because we're looking for a probability. Essentially, the the probability of um, it's it's a blue, so we're looking for the probability that it's blue, and given that it's a ball essentially. Oh, wait. OK, 
Okay, so essentially we're gonna look for the probability. Does anyone know the equation to solve for the given problems? What, do you, what formula that is? So if, if I have a, a probability of blue, it's typically written like this. Does anyone know what we're gonna do? Shouldn't we do the total of balls first, or is that wrong? So yeah, we we uh, found out the total. The total is um, twelve. So so we're we're essentially going to find the probability of it's blue and being a ball, and the pro and divide it by the probability of it being a ball because we also have cubes. So what's my probability of a blue ball? So it's three out of five? No, so what's our, what's our total? Wait, to be two oh, 12. 12, total, perfect. Yeah. It's 12, exactly. And it and you are right on the three, so we have three essentially uh, balls that are blue. So three, but we have 12 objects, objects in our bag out of 12. And now we're gonna divide that by the probability of grabbing a ball. What's my probability of grabbing a ball? Someone shout it out. Three. Seven. seven over 12. Perfect, seven over 12. And let me explain why it's seven over 12. So we have, we're, I said the probability of grabbing a ball. And these are the balls right here. So we have essentially a total of seven, seven balls. But we have 12 objects in our bag. And that's how we got this fraction right here. And so now that, does anyone know how to divide fractions? Essentially what we're gonna do is when we divide a fraction, it's written like this, but then this gets, when you divide a fraction, you're technically multiplying by its reciprocal. So this is gonna be turned into three over 12 times 12 over seven. What's 12 times three guys? 36. Perfect. And what's 12 times 7? 84. Perfect. And so this is a probability of getting a ball, a blue, a ball given that it's blue. But can we reduce this? Yes. Yes. And what can we reduce it by? 12. 12. Perfect, so we're gonna divide the top by 12 and the bottom by 12. And what fraction will that give me? Three over seven. Perfect. Um, I have a question. Couldn't we just like um, cancel out the 12s um, in the fraction, about like three over 12 divided by seven over 12? Can we just cross it out for it to equal three over seven? Yeah, you can, you can definitely do that. That's a, another trick. I was just um, going the in-depth way so um, everyone understands how that process works. But yeah, a little tip like how she was saying, a little trick is you can just cancel out the 12s and then that turns into three over seven. Uh, another way I did it, which I don't know if it was right, but I got the answer is I just added like the total of the balls together, which is seven. And then the blue is just three. So I put three over seven without doing like any of that. But I don't know if that's like how you're supposed to do it. I think that's what I was doing initially as well. Yeah. Mm, if, if that works, then yeah, do it that way. I personally like numbers and fractions better. I know that's weird, but that's just me. So I, I, I typically do it um, the way I showed. But yeah. So, so can I just make a comment? Oh, yeah, go for it. So that way totally works because the way you're thinking about it is I think you're you might be thinking about is it constructing a table where like you have three red and then four red uh, or you're constructing essentially like a table on how you've done it with like sensitivity and specificity. And what's really neat is you know that it's already given that it's a ball. So you can automatically eliminate all the blocks and just look at the probability of getting a ball, which we know the total is seven. And then you focus on, well, is it your red or your blue that you're looking for? So that's totally right too. And feel free to do it that way as well. Okay, thank you. Exactly. Can I see the question one more time? Because I solved it a different way and I don't think I got a good look at the question and that's why I solved it incorrectly. Oh yeah, let me, um, let me share my screen. You see that? 
Yeah, thank you. So yeah, so about a bag. And I'm not sure. Um, so do you have access to this uh, worksheet or no? Um, I have a different practice test. Uh, yeah, so no, I don't have access. Oh, okay. Yeah, you can go ahead and uh, take a picture of this uh, question if you um, want to practice it again later. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Any questions on number nine or um, should we move on to 10? Okay, so number 10, you roll a six sided die and then toss a coin. What is the probability that you get a one followed by a tells? Your answer should be in fraction form. Perfect. So you guys can go ahead and if you don't have the problem, you guys can go ahead and take a picture of that one really quick. Okay. So now let me share my screen. Let me check the chat really quick. Yeah, we're okay. Can you guys see that? Yes. Yeah. Perfect. Okay, so the question was asking if we, so we have a six sided die. And it's asking, um, what is the probability that we roll a one? Followed by um, flipping a tails on a coin. So what are the chances I roll a one? One out of six. Perfect. So we're looking for the probability of a one and tails. And does anyone know what this and kind of indicates or symbolizes? Multiplication. Perfect. So essentially that means we're gonna multiply these two probabilities to get um, the answer. So we have the probability of rolling a one, which someone said earlier was one six. And what's my probability of flipping a tails? One half. Perfect. And if we multiply across, that's gonna give us one out of 12. So this is the probability of us rolling a one and flipping a tails. Did anyone, did anyone have any questions on that one? Perfect, yeah. Anissa, you're, you're correct. All right, let's move on. Okay, number 11. Okay, so it's asking a first card is chosen from a thoroughly shuffled deck. The first card is returned to the deck, which is thoroughly shuffled again before a second card is drawn. What is the probability that the first card is a king and a second card is a two? Okay, so um, I just wanna mention something really quick. So right here, it's saying that the first card is returned to the deck. That's basically indicating that our total, our total card shuffled will remain the same. Um, unlike the one we did earlier, where if we took out the spoon, that utensil one, it brought us down to seven rather than eight. So I just wanna indicate that difference really quick because a lot of people sometimes um, get tripped up on that fact where you have to return that card to the deck. But, so if you guys want to take a picture of that question really quick, if you don't have it, and then I'm going to start sharing my screen again. Okay, so first we have the probability. So what is the probability that the first card is a king and the second card is a two? So first we have to find the problem. So it's, it's kind of similar in the last sense where we, we have to find the probability of an and question essentially. And when that, when that and pops out, that's indicating that we want to multiply. So we're first trying to find the probability of choosing a king. Okay. 
And then we also want to find the probability of our car, another card being pulling a two. So does anyone know, so if you're familiar with cards, how many, how many times does, would a two appear in the deck? Four times. Four. Perfect. So we know there are four twos in the deck. And how many kings are in the deck? Uh, there's four. four. Perfect, four. And this is essentially uh, saying the and part right here. And so that kind of means multiply. And so how many cards are in a deck? What's our total? 52. Perfect. And what happens when I return that card in the deck? I'm still going to get 52 again. So when we're doing that and, remember, we're going to want to multiply across. But um, also, we can also simplify, because I know I know someone's going to say that, say that. We can simplify before um, we move on. So what, what does this simplify to? Does anyone have an idea? One of the Perfect. So just brief explanation. They did that by dividing four by itself. That gives you one and 52 divided by four. That gives you 13. So now we can uh, essentially change this to, to make it easier on our lives. One over 13 times one over 13. So what's one times one? One. Perfect. Now what's 13 times 13? 169. Perfect. So this is the probability of choosing one king and a two. Does anyone have any questions on that? Let me check the chat real quick. So this is without replacement. Yes, this is uh, without replacement. So we, or no, it is with replacement because we're, we're replacing that card into the deck. If it were without replacement, then we'd be multiplying four over 52 times four over 51. But since we're replacing that card back into the deck, we're gonna stay at 52. Okay, any, any last questions before we move on? Did you say that if we um, submitted one over 169 that that would be correct too? Or they're looking for one over 13? Oh. One, so I was just saying that one over 13 over one over 13 is the simplified version of four over 52. Yeah. So, so our, our answer can't be one over 13 because we we're multiplying one over 13 by by itself twice. So our answer would be um, 169. Okay, okay. Okay, cool. Thank yeah, sorry you. if I sorry if I, my wording confused you, but yeah. So we we just uh, the way, reason why I mentioned one over thirteen is because I simply simplified this and this. Yeah, that's exactly what I would have done because we don't have calculators. So um. Yeah, and then once we multiply um, that over, we're gonna get this answer. Okay. Cool. Perfect. Okay, number 12. So the university has empirically determined probabilities for students using the walk pedestrian signals when crossing campus, drive, campus view drive. For the crosswalk near Craven Hall, the probability that students will wait for the walk signal is 80%. And, and the probability is 90.3% that students will wait for the walk signal when crossing near student union. Suppose a student is picked at, rat, picked at random at the Craven Hall crosswalk on a given day, and another student is picked at random at the student union crosswalk. The first question is asking, what is the probability that the student at the Craven Hall crosswalk will not wait for the walk signal? So what's the probability that someone at Craven Hall will jaywalk? 20. 20%. And I was going to share my screen, but I think, or do you, would you guys like me to share my screen and show you um, how to do this one? Or can you yes. guys do? Yeah. Yes, okay. please. Um, do you mind going back to the question first so we can look at it real quick? Oh, yeah. You, you guys can go ahead and take a picture real quick. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
Okay, I'm gonna share my screen now. You wanna take their pictures? Just don't get my face in the picture. <laughs> okay. So our, fir our first question was asking the probability of someone um, not waiting for the crosswalk. at Craven. So what is, so in the question, what is, what is the probability someone waits? Um, 80%. 80%. So, and this is asking the probability, the probability of someone not waiting at 80%. So what we're gonna first do, um, and you guys, well, if you want to leave it as a percentage, we can. So we're trying to figure out the people essentially who, that are jaywalking. So that's going to be the, the leftover percentage. And when we have a percent, what is the total percentage? 100. Yes, that's the total. So now we're to find the people who are jaywalking, we're going to want to subtract the people who are waiting at the crosswalk by our total, which is 100%. So 100% minus 80% equals 20%. Did everyone see how I did that? Yeah, that's super easy. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the second question on number 12 is asking, what is the probability that the student at the student union crosswalk will not wait for the walk signal? So this is essentially the same concept. So we have that um, the people who actually will wait at the crosswalk on a uh, student union, I think it's 90.3. So that's our peop the people who will wait. And remember, we're trying to find the people who will not wait at the crosswalk. So to do that, we're gonna get our total and subtract our people who will wait. And what is that gonna give us, guys? Um, would it be 9.7%? Perfect. 9.7. Um, for the sake of time, I'm not going to ex explain um, how we did it mathematically. I explained earlier um, the little tricks, um, how we do it. But we're going we're gonna to just move on really quick because we have 10 minutes. So what is, so the, the third one's asking, what is the probability that neither of the students wait for the crosswalk. So essentially, what is the probability that that someone jaywalks at Craven and the probability that someone jaywalks at at Student Union? That's like you, kind of what that neither is getting at. Do you add them? So because we're not, it's cool. So we're not gonna add. So I said the probability that, so the probability that someone jaywalks at Craven and the probability that someone jaywalks at student union. You multiply. Don't we multiply? Perfect. So when when it, so that neither when it's saying neither it's it's basically kind of like and like neither that neither of them. So one so this this person's going to jaywalk and this person's going to jaywalk on those two streets. So that's why I said that and I emphasize the and cuz the and or the neither kind of uh kind of symbolizes the multiplication factor. So we're we're going to multiply the percentages we found. So when we multiply that, we're technically multiplying the probability of not waiting, someone not waiting at Craven, and multiplying the probability of someone not waiting at Student Union. And this probability is going to be if we, we multiply, are we change this percentage into a decimal, 0. 0.20? 
and we change this percentage. So these, when it's like a sing, like a 9.7, when you change this, make sure you move it over twice. Because I know I've made this the mistake before where I accidentally do 0 0.97. This is not 0 0.97. This is 0 0.097. I just wanted to emphasize that because that's a common mistake I see a lot. So 0 0.097. And um, when we multiply those together, we're going to get the percentage of the probability that neither student uh, J walks at the walk signals. And that's going to give us 0.0194. Did everyone get that concept? I'm going to assume um, people understand that one since everyone's quiet. OK. Problem 13, which I think is OK. Not that much. OK, so each question on a multiple choice exam has four choices. One of the choices is the correct answer worth a total of four points. Another choice is the wrong another choice is wrong, but still carries partial credit for two points. And the two other choices are worth zero points. If a student picks at random, guessing, what is expect the expected value of his or her score for a problem? Here's the fun one. Um, you guys could go, I'll, I'll leave it up for a second so you guys can take a picture of that. Okay. Share my screen now. Everyone see that? Yes. Perfect. So we have so we have a multiple choice exam. And for one of the questions, we have four choices. A, B, C, and D. This is just hypothetical. So if I choose, say, let's say A is the correct answer. The correct answer is worth four points, correct? B is wrong, but let's just say B has partial credit, just like it said in the answer. The choice is wrong, but still carries partial credit of two points. And that we, all, we know that the rest of the answers are wrong, but those are worth zero points. So that means C is wrong and it's worth zero. D is wrong and it's worth zero. So now it's essentially, so to find, it's, it's, you guys have heard of the expected value like formula, right? Or the expected value like equation? Yeah? Yes. Okay, so to find out the probable or expected value, we're going to multiply uh, essentially the probability of the choices we're picking by its profit or what the points we're gaining. So we have, if I choose A, what's my probability of choosing A? You want to take a stab at that? It'd be one over four. One over four, because if I choose A, that's one of my answers out of the four out of the four choices. So one of one out of four, correct. Okay, so if I choose A, what are what's my profit? What's my point? Four. 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 Perfect. Perfect. And plus the probability of me choosing B multiplied by its profit. So what's my probability of choosing B? Same thing. One fourth, perfect. And it's points two, and then so on. So, as we continue, what's one fourth times four? One. Yeah, it is one. Um, for the sake of 
like visualize so people can visualize um, the rest of the steps, I'm going to leave it as fraction form. So four out of four. But yes, that technically does equal one. And then the probability, uh, and then what happens when I multiply one fourth by two? I'm going to get two fourths. And one fourth by zero, zero. And then one fourth by zero, zero. So when I have these two fractions and I add them, what will I get? Um, six over four. Perfect. And if we divided that out, we know four can go into six one and a half times. So this is our expected points where we, we will earn if we just guess. Did everyone see how I did that? Or did I confuse anyone? Can you explain how it's 1.5? Okay, so yeah, definitely. So we have four and we're trying to see how many times it can go into six. So how many times does four go into six? Once. Once. And now drop down that 20. How many times does four go into 20? Five. And that's how I got that 1.5. I was thinking about it way too hard. It makes sense. Thank you. No, it's all right. That, yeah, that happens uh, sometimes. Sometimes we uh, overthink it. But yeah, so essentially, um, just a breakdown of this problem. We're getting the probability of choosing the, that multiple choice answer, which is one fourth, multiplying it by its profit or its points is essentially what we're winning. And then we're gonna add up the rest of the probabilities while, while being multiplied by their points. Does anyone have any questions? Stop sharing and let's move on. Fourteen. So for a game, the average amount you can expect to win or lose per play in the long run can be measured by which of the following? Expected value. Uh, I think you're right. <laughs> That's right, right, Trevor? <laughs> so, so okay. The the weird thing about this, I, I think that this might have uh, the wrong answers on it. So, expected value is the best answer, but when it says for in the long run, usually we think of what? What 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 are we talking about when we're talking about getting a value in the uh, in the long run. Does anyone have an idea? Um, a value that we can kind of expect? Yeah, it's a, it's a value that we can expect. And if we're playing a game um, over and over and over again, a bunch of times, make it basically, if we play it um, basically any large number of times, we can apply kind of what is the, the law of large numbers. So usually playing in the long run in, uh, is referred to or, or is connected to the law of large numbers but I don't see that as an answer here. So the, the best answer here would be expected value, but I, um, in my opinion, I do think, um, uh, I think they meant to put uh, law of large numbers. I don't think it's there. So expected value is definitely the best answer. If anyone yeah, wants me to continue on that, I can definitely keep telling you. So yeah, thank you for, for, for checking with me. Any continued questions on that? I know that was kind of a weird way to answer that. I just didn't want you guys to be led astray should you see a similar question on the exam that has law of large numbers and get it wrong for that reason. Okay. So number 15, suppose you decide to open a casino offering only one game. You win a dollar 95% of the time and your customer wins $4 5% of the time. What is the probability your expected prop or what is your expected profit if this game is played once? I am so sorry to, to, to butt in, Chris. Um, just for people who didn't see it in the chat, we're going to keep going until kind of the end of the, um, 
end of the review and see if you guys continue to have questions. Like, feel free to stay. I know this was scheduled to end at 5 p.m., but we, we're, go, we're going later. You guys are here and you guys are asking for help, so we're happy to help. So keep on keeping on, Chris. Sorry for bothering you guys. No, perfect. Yeah, you guys can go ahead and stay. Um... So yeah, so the question's asking, how much profit would you expect to have if 8,000 games were, are played? It's a lot of money. But essentially, so what we're going to do is we're going to try to find um, the percentage. So it's expected value. So we're trying to find our, our, our probability and multiplying it by its profit or its winnings. And then we're going to multiply that 8,000 times because we're playing 8,000 uh, 8, games. So I can show you that mathematically. Let me share my screen. So first I want to find kind of like my percentage of winning and its profit. So what's the percent of me winning a dollar? What's the probability of me winning a dollar? Anyone want to shout that out? 95%. Perfect. Thank you. Now what's my percent of me winning Five, or yeah, what's my probability of we, me winning four dollars? Five percent. Perfect. And remember, like I said, five percent. It's not. It's not going to be um fifty, or it's not going to be point fifty. It's going to be. We want to move that decimal over twice, so it's going to be point zero five. So now what's one times 0.95? 1.95. 1. Perfect. I'm sorry, where did you get that four from? So it says, oh wait, your customer wins four dollars five percent of the time. Okay, that's what I thought, but never mind. Thank you. <laughs> no, you're good. So yeah, um, quick question. So when, when our customer wins, that means we're actually losing money. The casino's losing money. So I'm gonna add a little negative right here because me, the casino that I opened up, it's, it's losing money when the customer is winning. So when I multiply negative 4.05, what am I going to get? Um, would it be negative 0.2? Perfect. Negative 0.2. So what's 95 plus negative 0.2? 175. Perfect. 0.75. So if I'm profiting 75% of the time and I'm playing 8,000 games, This is how much, this is how to solve our profit for our profit, our expected value. And if we multiply that out, that's going to give us 6,000. Did everyone see that? Or understand what I did there? Real quick, do you think you can show me how um, 0.2 ends up being a negative? Um, yeah, so it's not, it's, it, it's nothing I could really show you mathematically. It's just that in the problem, it's saying that, so suppose we open the, the casino and, and for the casino, for us to win money, our customers have to lose, essentially. Uh, casinos are savage. So for, for us to make profit, uh, customers have to lose. But it's saying that in the problem, it's saying your customer wins $4. I mean, uh, yeah, your customer wins $4 5% of the time. So if our customer is winning, that means we're losing the money. That's why I added that negative, that negative 0 0.20 because we're losing $4 5% of the time when the, cust when the customer wins. 
Okay, so it's just our ant- anticipated loss, pretty much? Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Okay, sweet. Thank you. I just got all confused by the wording. Uh, I'm sorry about that. So I also see that it's asking, what is your expected profit if this game is played once? Would you just multiply that by one? Um, so if it's played, this is our expected profit if the game is played once. It's 75 cents. Oh, okay. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Perfect. Did, did everyone get that or did, did you want me to go over it one more time? If so, just let me know because I know sometimes I, I may, my words may be confusing. If not, we'll move on. I also just have a small question. So um, when we input that, should we put the decimal and then 75 or is it just $75? It's 75 cents. So it's okay. definitely add the, the decimal because one game, my for one game, I'm profiting 75 cents. Oh, okay, okay. So if I'm prof, so if I'm playing 8,000 games, I'm going to profit 75 cents 8,000 times. So that's why I did this. Because I'm playing 8,000 8, times and I'm, and I'm profiting 75 cents. So I'm winning a total of $6,000. Or I'm, I'm, yeah, gaining $6,000. Got it. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Last question. So mathematics does not <laughs> tell you how to behave, but it can tell you the consequences of certain types of behavior. Given that the expected value of all casino games is positive for the casino, what does the law of large numbers, this is what Trevor mentioned earlier. What does sorry, the law- you, sorry, I don't want to interrupt. Can you scroll down because your screen still says number 14? <sighs> My bad, guys. Thank you. <laughs> sorry, guys. I forgot. Uh, mathematics does not tell you how to behave, but it can tell you the consequences of certain types of behavior. Given that the expected value of all casino games is positive for the casino, what does the law of large numbers say will happen in the long term to a person who wages money at casinos? Does anyone know the answer to that? Um, would it be number three? Yes. So the reason why it's number three is because the expected value for the casino games are positive for the casino. So that means the casino is positive. They're profiting. So that means if the casino is profiting, the people or the person is losing money in the long run. And if Trevor, if you want to go over more like of a definition type of uh, exp- explanation, um, you, you can go ahead and explain. But that's just uh, my logic on it. So yes, the answer is going to be this one. Any more questions, concerns? Any example questions someone needs help pulling up? And someone needs help with, we can pull it up and go ahead and go through it. Can you explain the reasoning of that one again, really quick? Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll try my best. So essentially, so it, it says that given that the expected value of all casino games is positive. So um, for example, so, or let me share my screen again. I didn't realize I wasn't sharing. Okay. So it's saying right here, given that the expected value of all casino games is positive for the casino. So that means the casino is positive for their expected value, AKA their profit or profit. Okay, so they're earning, right? They're That's, earning. Yeah. So in the long run, what does a large number say? So the, lar- the rule of large numbers say will happen in the long term to a person who wagers money at the casino. So it's not talking about us. It's not talking about the, the people who own the casinos. It's talking about the, the people who wagers money at the casino. And if I'm the casino, if I own the casino and I'm profiting all this money and people keep coming in and playing my games and I'm coming out positive, what are they going to come out? Less than <laughs> They're going to come out negative. Yeah, they're going to come out with empty pockets. So that means in the long run, I'm making all this money because I'm the casino owner. 
all the person, all the people or the, the person, a person will lose their money in the long run if, while the casino earns profit. Does that make sense? Is that a better um, explana uh, explanation or did you want me to go more further into it? No, I kind of got the perspective after you explained it a little more. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. So also that's that's like facts. Like casinos always win the money. So does anyone uh, want to go over anything else? Any, and it doesn't have to be, if you guys have any questions, they don't have to be from this problem set. If you guys have any other like homework questions you're struggling with, we can, um, you guys can share your screen and we can go ahead and go over them really quick. Uh, I wanted to go over question four, if you could, about the spoons and the fork. Um, for the practice exam? Yes. Question four. Okay, yeah, so this one's kind of um, a little complicated. Uh, Trevor, are you still here? Or Ruben? So I just stepped out um, and then I came back. Oh, no, that's fine. Um, <laughs> What's up? So um, um, I'm not too good at explaining this one, but for number four, um, someone had a question in regards to the explanation as to um, why, why the answer is um, three out of seven. Okay. So, oh, go ahead. No, feel feel free if you. I'll, I'll let you take a stab at it. I, 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 it. Hearing it from different people is so good for everyone. So, um, so the reasoning why as to it's going to be three over seven is because you can think of it as it's asking. So the desired probability we want is to get make sure the second utensil matches the first. So we have two cases where we can think of that where. As long as the second one matches the first, everything's totally fine. So we have one instance where you can think of it as, well, I'm going to first pull out a fork. And you don't even have to consider a probability of that because you're just pulling out one of them and you're guaranteed to get a spoon or a fork. So it doesn't matter which one you pull out because it's just asking that the second one has to match the first one. And since it's asking for the second one to match, well, the first one doesn't really matter because you can get either one. But once you've picked out the first one, you have to make sure that the second one is identical. So because you already pulled out one of the utensils, whether it be a fork or a spoon, and so you pulled out one of the utensils, right? And then you're left now with seven utensils. And because you're now left with total, well, that's your number of total outcomes, and you're left with three of those utensils, so the probability of getting two of the same utensils would be three out of seven. Does that clarify it a little more? Do you want me to explain it a different way or? Yes, I understand better now. Thank you. Perfect. Do you, um, Ruben, did you have like an iPad or anything where, are you able to explain that like visually with like drawing out the fractions and stuff? Um, yeah, I can share my screen too. Let me see, hold on. Let me stop sharing. Just so, cause I know some students uh, learn it visually. Yeah, definitely. So can you all see the whiteboard? Yeah. Okay, perfect. So think of it as if you want, you have a total, your total is eight. So your total utensils you have is eight. And what you're trying to figure out is whether or not, uh, well, you're, you want the probability that the second utensil matches the first. So that, so if you want the probability of the second utensil, I'm sorry, I'm writing with my hand. Um, if you want the probability that the second utensil matches the first, well, that first utensil, so this first one, can be, it can be either a fork or a spoon. It doesn't matter as long as you get a utensil, which we know that's gonna happen. So let's just say first we get a fork. Well, then we would, um, we're gonna multiply because well, it's guaranteed that first utensil is gonna happen. And then the second utensil, what we're left with since we took out one of the forks, we're left with three forks out of a total of seven. So we can ensure that the probability of getting two of the same utensils for forks is three out of seven. And the same logic applies for spoons. If we get a first one as a spoon, then well, we're left with three spoons out of a total of seven. So that first one really doesn't matter because you're just, what well, your main goal or your end goal is to make sure that you get the second utensil to match the first. 
Okay. And technically, will we have to add them together? But if you reduce it, it'd be three seven two. Um, you wouldn't add them because it's not saying the probability of getting both utensils, like either a fork or a spoon. It's just saying you want one of them to match. It's not saying, um, it's not asking for both cases, like probably in the probability of getting a fork or the probability of getting two spoons. It's not okay. asking for either or both cases, like an or statement. So it's just asking specifically one, one designated pair of utensils. Okay. Thank you. Uh-huh. I was wondering if we could go over number 10 again. I had to step out, so I missed when we reviewed it. So I just want to make sure I did it right. OK, um, Chris, do you have a problem? Can you pull them up? Yeah, um, before we go over that one, someone actually asked in the chat if we can go over a contingency table one. Um, so I can show that one really quick. And then I'll show you um, how to do number 10. So. Uh, another, we kind of created another example with the contingency table. Let's see. Can you guys see this problem? Yes. Perfect. So uh, essentially we have this contingency table and it's empty and it, we want to fill it up. So suppose a test for disease has a sensitivity of 90% and a specificity of 95%. Further, suppose that in a certain country with a population of 1 million, 20% uh, of the population has the disease. Fill in the table. So we're trying to fill out this empty contingency table. And if you guys want to screenshot this um, picture really quick or take a pic or this problem, take a picture of it, I'm going to share my screen really quick so I can show you um, what the process is. I'll just give you a few seconds, take a picture. Everyone see my whiteboard or, yeah? Yeah, I can see it. So we know that the sensitivity, so we have a, a test for a disease that has the sensitivity of 90%. So that means 90% of the time, it's gonna be a true positive. And we have a specificity of 95%. So 95% of the time, it's going to be a true negative. And the people who are infected with the disease who have it is 20% of our total population. And our total, our total population is 1 million. So now let's, let me just write out this table really quick. Okay, so what, so what is my total population? How many people are in this population of, being, of uh, having the disease? One million. Correct. One million. And we know that 20% of the population is infected. So if I wanna find out the total people who have the disease, what should I do? take the 20% of the 1 million population. Perfect. So 
20% of the 1 million population, that means we're going to multiply 20% times 1 mil. And for the sake of time, I'm just going to do that in my calculator. That's going to give us 200,000. And what is this 200,000? What box should I put this in? Um, for the totals where it says has disease. Perfect, exactly. Okay, so we, we also know that it has a 90%, this test has a 90% specificity. So we know that 90% of the people who have the disease actually test positive. So what's going to be my next step to find to fill out this box? What what what's going to be my next step? Wait, 90 times 200,000. Perfect. So we're going to do 0. 0.90 times oh my God. 0. 0.90 times 200,000. Right, and what do you think that's going to give us? Correct, it's gonna give us 180,000. And to find this box, we can, simply, we can simply multiply, I mean multiply, we can simply subtract 180,000 from 200,000. And that should give us 20,000. Did everyone see how I did that? Okay, so now we have this last, we have to fill out this row or this column and this column. So now that we have, okay, so uh, can I erase this guys? You guys got this part? Yeah, cool. So now what am I gonna do to solve for this box? Someone shout it out real quick. Subtract a million from 200,000. Perfect. So we have this mill and we're gonna subtract 200,000 and that's gonna give us 800,000. And we also know our specificity is 95%. So that means 95% of the time, people are gonna test negative and not have the disease. So, so what should I do to find out, find that box out? Correct, multiply 95%, aka 0.95 by 800,000. Why do I keep putting the comment? So if we do 0. 0.95 times 800,000, that's going to give us 760,000. And to find out this box, we can simply subtract 800,000 minus 760,000. That should give us 40,000. Quick question. Yes. I somehow tried to solve it on my own and I uh, got 40,000 for D instead of B, um, but I'm not sure what I did wrong. When you say D and B, what are you referring to? Are you just referring to like the boxes? Yeah. So where's the D at? Is it right here? Or is it right here? Yeah, so I know the 40,000 you have is B, um, but what I ended up doing is somehow those two numbers were switched for me. So I know somewhere I messed up. Because I got the same numbers, oh, I just put them on the wrong spot. Yeah, they're switched. I put them on the wrong spot. Yeah, okay, so um, the mistake right there was the, I guess your wording. So we know specificity, 
specificity is essentially the true negatives and sensitivity is essentially the true positives. So when we're saying specificity of 95%, we're saying the people who test negative and do not have the disease. So that's why we're gonna put it in this box, in box D, I think you said. You understand? Did you, did you understand that explanation? Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. And to solve for the rest of the columns, um, we can add up um, the rows. So if I do 80, 180,000 plus 40,000, it's gonna give us 220,000. And then 20,000 plus 760,000. And that's, that's how you do the contingency table for, for the person who asked. I hope that, that made sense. Um, awesome. Awesome, I'm glad you guys um, are are getting help and I'm glad that you guys think this is helpful. Okay, so someone asked about number 10, correct? Any questions before I move on from this one? No. And who had a question about number 10? I did, I was just wondering if we could go over it really quickly because I had to step away when we, when you guys did do it. Oh yeah, yeah. Let me um, share my screen so people can see. Okay, number 10. So yeah, this is similar to uh, our contingency table uh, one we just did. So did you need help with both the parts or just one of these parts? Um, I think that one's number eight. Oh shit, my bad. I was, no, looking, good. I was looking at the 10 points and I'm, I'm tripping. No worries. I'm dyslexic. Okay, so, oh, okay. Number 10, I like this one. So if you guys can screenshot that problem if you don't have it really quick, I'll erase this. So the problem's asking, so you roll a six-sided die and then you toss a coin. What is the probability that you get a one followed by a tails? So essentially it's asking, what is the probability I roll a die, get a one, and I roll, I flip a coin and get a tails. And to do that mathematically, I'm gonna share my screen. So, we have, so in a, in a die, what's my probability of getting a one if I'm rolling a die? One out of six. One out of six, perfect. So we're trying to find the probability of a die on rolling on one and the probability of uh, flipping a coin on tails. So we have that uh, the probability of me rolling one is one out of six. And when I do this and, that means we're gonna multiply. When, whenever it says and, we're kind of multiplying. And what's the probability of me flipping a tails? One half. One half, perfect. So now that we have the probability of rolling the one and probability of getting a tails, we're gonna multiply across and that's going to give us 112, 112. Perfect, thank you. Mm -hmm. Perfect, so Jess wants to go over a homework problem. Um, what homework problem is that? Um, can I share my screen? Uh, yep. Yeah, sh try it, try it. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Perfect. Hold on. 
not showing me. You see it? Yeah. I was like, I was wondering if you guys could see it. I, I, I can see it. Okay, I see it now. Okay. Okay, so a certain small college runs two sections of Math 101 every semester. One taught by a professor A and, oh, his name's Professor A. Okay, my bad. Uh, one taught by Professor A and the other taught by Professor B. At the end of the semester, they both polled their classes to find out which part of the course students like the most. So the data is collected, summarizing the following table and used to compute empirical probabilities concerning student semesters. What is the probability that a student is at the college who takes Math 101, will take it with Professor B and prefer probability? What is the probability that a student is, a, is, a col is at this college? Okay, so let me write, write this down really quick because I can't, uh, actually, I'm going to just take a picture of the problem. Okay. If you guys want to go over this problem with us, um, go ahead and take a picture unless you can pull it up on your web design. Yeah, and if you need, uh, uh, if you have any questions on this one, I, I just did it in the camp breakout. Oh, you did? Yeah. Oh, then do you want to just go over this one really quick with that? Yeah, sure. You just did it. <laughs> You're pro. <laughs> you could go ahead and stop sharing your screen, Jess, and then um, Trevor's going to take over and explain. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Cool. Let me pull up. I will ask you to give me the numbers on that uh, that table again. So Professor uh, A, uh, then it was Professor B, there was prefers probability and then prefers finance. So it's gonna be 20 on your left on your left column for prefers on both bottom and top. 20 and 20? Mm -hmm. Oh, no, bottom and top. So um, for Professor B, it's going to be 20 and Professor A, it's, I mean, for Professor A, it's going to be 20 on both. Oh, wait, oh you, okay. did, you did it a bit. I did it wonky here. here. Just tell me. Sorry, I, I should have looked at it a little bit. The professors are at the going to be at the top. Uh, so A and Professor B and then probability and finance. Awesome. And then it's uh, 20 and 20. Oh, no, 20 and 20 up here and then 20 down here. For Professor A, it's 20 for both. Okay. And then and Professor B? 16, 24. So the first part asks... Uh, 20, what... 20. I'm sorry. Huh? Um, Professor B is 24 for finance. Oh, okay. Yeah, that makes sense. So, um, so for uh, letter A, um, it's asking what is the probability that professor, what is it? It's professor B, B and prefers, prefers prob probability. I mean, so, yeah. so, sorry, did you, someone have a question? Okay. So it's, uh, we see that it's, uh, it's a little bit different than B and C and we'll talk about the differences in a sec. So a says, what is the probability that it's Professor B and prefers probability? So when we talk about, uh, so probability that it's Professor B, well, we see that uh, how many total are in Professor B? We see there are 40. Out of how many total students? So we see there's 40 in this class and 40 in this class. So there, so the probability of Professor B equals 40 out of 80. Probability that someone prefers probability, which is a silly thing to say, 
is, well, we see that there are 20 plus 16, so 36 out of 80. Oh my gosh, this I'm actually so I would get the same answer, but this is this is a kind of a, a, a messed up way to do this. So I do want to, uh, I'll, yeah, I did this a silly way at first. So, so um, it would simplify and, and, and be right, but we want to find out basically the cross section of those who are in Professor B's class and those per, who prefer probability. So that would give us that would be 16 out of the 80. I'm so sorry about that. It was more of what sets are we dealing with uh, question. So if I multiply these together, if I use that and property, um, I would get the same, I would get the same thing. It would cancel out and, and end up being the same thing, but I will, I will not do that to us. Uh, so sorry about that. So for A, it's going to be the 16 out of 80. Does anyone have questions on why that is? If anyone does, feel free to put in the chat. Uh, Chris will be looking out. Um, but so now B is saying, okay, what is the probability that they prefer probability given that they're in Professor B's class? So a little bit of a different situation. So when we have given that, uh, it's uh, called a conditional probability, and that's P of A given B equals the probability of A and B over the probability of B. We get the, we get the, new, uh, the new denominator. So, so just to represent this, so we want the probability of uh, that prefer, so prefers probability given Professor B is equal to the probability that they prefer probability and Professor B, and they took Professor B over the probability of getting Professor B. So this is similar to um, one from the uh, practice exam. So probability that they prefer Professor B uh, is going, sorry, uh, we already have the probability that they prefer uh, probability and prefer, and I'll start taking Professor B from A. So that's going to be 16 over 80. And again, that was just kind of, we, we see, okay, probability, and Professor B, where those, that row meets that column is 16 out of the total. So then what's the probability of having Professor B well, we go to our total here, we say, okay, so Professor B has 40 of the students. So there is a 40 out of 80 chance that someone would get Professor B. Then when we, uh, when we divide fractions, we multiply by reciprocal, 16 over 80 times uh, 80 over 40. 80s cancel and we get 16 over 40. Now we would still want to um, we would want to simplify this. So I divide by the greatest uh, well the least common <laughs> greatest common factor. Divide by eight to the top and bottom. Sixteen divided by eight is two. Forty divided by eight is five. So that gives us our answer there. What I do want to mention is another way that we can think about this is instead of representing it this way, if we know that they're taking Professor B, then we just look at the subset uh, that prefers probability. So going up here, we say, so I'm only gonna focus on uh, this side because I already know they're in Professor B. Well, of those that are in Professor B, I see 16 out of the 40 um, preferred probability. So that gives us that, that same, uh, sorry, that same total there. Any other questions on that? Would it be possible to go over how to get the PPB and MPB if there's time? If there's time, yeah, we could, we could do that. Um, before that, someone actually asked um, for us the question above in the chat. Oh, okay. Oh, thank you for letting me know. Thanks for, thanks for watching out on that. Yeah. Um, so then the last part of that is, 
exactly the same as this one. So it's, and that's because these are independent kind of things that can happen. So uh, and that's a probability of Professor B given that the student prefers probability. And we're gonna handle that the same way. So that's gonna be probability of Professor B given, oh, sorry, and prefers probability over the probability that someone prefers probability. Again, horrible thing to say. So we already know what the, the and is from our, our, our top uh, part, and that's 16 over 80. And the number of people who prefer probability, so if I go up, so we know that they, uh, that they can either prefer probability or finance. Those who prefer probability are going to be 36 out of the 80. So that's gonna be our total down here, 36 out of the 80. So then simplifying that, we have 16 equals 16 over 80 times 80 over 36. These cancel 16 over 36, taking out the greatest common factor, which I believe is four, gives us four over nine. Any questions on that? I just wanted to clarify for this problem. I think it's asking for it as a percentage, just a heads up for who is asking oh, for, for it. For anyone, okay. Yeah. Um, did you, did you, uh, did you have a question on how to get any of these guys as percent? No, I, I just wanted to make sure, um, everyone knew that that's all. <laughs> okay. I very much appreciate that. Yeah. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you for that. Thank you for this. <laughs> yeah. People are like, what the heck? Why isn't it going? <laughs> cool. Thank you so much for your clarification there. Any of other course. questions on this one? So for that problem, uh, is there a different way to get that amount um, like we did on, on B that we was just looking at the columns or no? Is this the only way to uh, find it? Uh, yes, here, let me share just real quick. Yeah, uh, good question. So, so if we're given that they prefer probability, so those who, yeah, I should have shown that, uh, thank you. So if we're given that they prefer probability, we know we're just looking at this subset. So there are 36 who prefer probability. Well, what's the, the uh, probability that they took Professor B? Well, that's gonna be the 16 out of the 36 there. I'm really glad you asked on that, yes. And that gives you uh, to that part. Okay, awesome, thank you. Yeah, you're right. That's probably an easier way to look at it. <laughs> Trevor, you, you think so deeply about it. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to make sure I'm using the uh, the, the things from the lecture correctly. <laughs> no, I get you. Uh, cool. There's, there's a lot of tricks I could have showed, but I was like, I don't know if the professor shows them this way. That's fair. Yeah, but talking about, you know, the formulas and stuff like that, as long as we get the right answer, there shouldn't be an issue, right? If we have, we actually do either option of how to solve it. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Your professor should accept um, the answer as long as it's correct. If, as long as you show your work on how you got there. Okay. And, you work, and the way it worked. So just make sure you show your work. Yeah. And this phone number problem, I've never, I've never done one like this. Personally. Oh, okay. Yeah, you want me to do it? Yeah, I've, I've, I don't even know if this is, this one's gonna be on the test. Um, I don't know. It, it might. It, okay. It's, a, it's a good question. They might have a counting principle one. Yeah, go. Can you mind going over this one? I want to. I need to learn this. Yeah, one. I don't mind. Um, so it was three two three, and what was the other number? Three six three. Three, two, oh, sorry. sorry. Three, no. two, three, three, four, two, and three, nine, six. Three, nine, six. So if we want to find the number of different combinations of numbers uh, uh, that start with those. 
Yes, it's yeah. How many phone numbers are available? Cool. And it's seven number phone numbers, right? I believe so. Yeah, yeah, seven. Cool, cool, cool. So we'll so we'll we'll break it into we'll break it into cases. So looking at this one, so we say, okay, so what when it's asking for the different number of like combinations that we can do, um, what we want to talk about is well, what of our what are our available options for each space? So how many available options do I have for my first number of this one? Four, oh, for the nine. Is it nine or 10? 10. 10, because we're going to include zero. Yes. So what about for our second? 10. What about for our third? 10. What about for our fourth? 10. So the number of different numbers that we could make, seven digit numbers, uh, starting with 323, three, is going to be 10 times 10 times 10 times 10, or 10 to the fourth, or however you want to write that. So now, what about here? Is this going to be the same? Yes. Yes, it is. So 10 to the fourth, and what about here? Different here or the same here? Same. Okay. So then how do we put these together? If we want the total number of numbers, are we gonna add them or multiply them? Add them? Yes. So we would add them up. It would be uh, 10 to the fourth plus 10 to the fourth plus 10 to the fourth. And if you don't like that way of showing it, we could just call this 10,000 plus 10,000 plus 10,000. And if we add those up, we get 30,000. And that's how you do that one. Thank you. So writing it out like this, if you get one of those uh, combinatorics problems, um, just writing it out like this uh, and being like, okay, how many choices do I have for each is probably like, that's the most helpful way that I, I, I do it. Good question. Any other questions on that or ones like that? No, that was good. Thank you. That made a lot more sense. Cool, cool, cool. I'm glad it helped. So then the PPV and P1, you want to take that one? Neighbors are kind of loud. <laughs> Sorry, I was muted. Yeah, I, I could take that one. Uh, let me see if I can find a good example problem. Um, did, did you have an, um, I'm talking to the students, did you guys have any example problems for PPV and MPV that we can go over together? And I can kind of um, show you. If not, I can I can try to look through one really quick. Um, I have one. Oh yeah, if you can go ahead and share your screen and show us, and then we can take a look. Um, well, I have my web design on my other computer because like it won't open on the one that I'm like doing the Zoom with, but I can tell you the numbers because there's just a few of them. Uh, okay, can you can you read me the question first really quick, please? Um, sure. So it says, the following table shows the results of a medical test. So it's just a test positive, test negative, and then has disease, does not have the disease columns. Okay. Um, and then it says, use the preceding data to calculate the negative predictive value and then the positive predictive value. Okay. So test positive, test negative, has disease, doesn't have, and then yeah, can you tell me the numbers? So for test positive and has the disease, it's 170. And for test negative and has the disease, it's 34. Test negative has disease, 
34. And then you said the first, uh, mention the first one again. Test positive and has the disease is 170. And then um, does not have the disease, but test positive is 40. Okay. And does not have the disease and tested negative is 390. And then test negative and has the disease is 34, correct? Yeah. Okay. Let me go ahead and share. So like this, correct? Um, yeah. Okay. So we have the people who, we, we have the, the columns filled out and we're trying to uh, calculate the percentage, right? The predicted positive value and the MPV, which is the negative, uh, predicted negative positive value, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Basically like percentages, right? Yes. So basically, we're going to do 170 plus 34. We're going to first total it out. So we have 204. And then we have 40 plus 390, 430. So, so, so pretend like we kind of have to reverse reverse what we do in the process of when it's given us this, the MPV or the PPV, and then we try to figure out how to fill out the columns in between. So we have the total. And typically what we do is we, we would, um, I'm gonna do MPV first. So we have the total and typically what we would do is we would multiply the MPV to get this number inside, correct? Yeah. So, so now to find the MPV, we kind of have to just reverse uh, reverse operations or inverse operations with this equation. So we're gonna do to 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 find it. We're gonna divide four thirty out, and we're gonna do that on both sides because what we do to one side, we're gonna do it to the other. So when so the MPV when we divide out four thirty. That's going to give us 0 0.906, also e which also is 90.6%. And so when we do PPV, we do the same process. We have 204 total, which is our total, times our PPV, which gives us 170. So to find out the PPV, the percentage, same process, divide 204 on both sides. 170 divided by 204. Our PPV is going to equal 0.833333, aka 80%. Okay, thank you. I did this like problem and I don't know why it says it's wrong because I put 90.6, but um, yeah, I don't know. I'm gonna ask my professor because like, I just thought I was confused. Like I thought I had it like wrong, but I was pretty sure like I was doing it right. Mm, yeah. Sometimes even weather sign can be wrong. I, I just want to mention that. Um, and if, if you get that case, you can always bring that to your professor. Yeah, I'm just going to put ask your teacher or whatever, but thank exactly. you. Mm -hmm. So I think um, that was going to conclude our session today. Any last minute questions, three minute solution questions? Just to be clear, you guys are doing these type of sessions for every exam we take? Yes. 
Okay, thank you so much. Yeah, um, actually even more on that. Um, so that's gonna be an at least situation. Uh, we're gonna look into seeing if we can offer these just kind of more often even on my homeworks and stuff. But at least we'll be doing them for every exam. Okay, thank you so much. Absolutely. Thank you guys so thank much you. for joining and, listen, and uh, hearing about Math 101. Thank you. <laughs> thank you so much, appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely guys, good luck. Have a great day guys. Thank you, you guys too. Mm -hmm. Goodbye. Dude, that was crazy. I, like, I got stage fright. <laughs> Dude, I honestly got stage fright. When I saw 80 people in there, like 86 or 90, I was like, oh my gosh. Like, I'm going to have to tutor 80 people. <laughs> Dude, I think, I think we got the most because these are gonna, uh, like, this was more Math 101 visits than we've had in the, like, in, in the center. Well, no, uh, it's more students came to this than students have visited the center. In the center, yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh, dude, that was awesome. That was successful. Dude, that was so successful. That was the most successful one that has gone on, dude. Thank dude, you so much. that was crazy. <laughs> That was awesome. Like we had so many students come in and ask for help. And I felt like they actually genuinely like understood and got help. Like everyone kind of had a, a relative good understanding of what was going on and what we were tutoring. That blew my mind. Cause like, yeah, usually people just kind of like watch and kind of are silent, but you could tell people are like, wait, I tried it this way. And like, I think it's cause the way you set it up was really good. You were like, Hey, put your stuff in, put, put your answers in the chat. So they're like, okay, I need to be involved. And, yeah. Oh man. Yeah, dude. Dude, that's, that's awesome. <laughs> yeah. Pretty yeah. glad. Pretty glad. Dude, thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much for that. Uh huh. Yeah. Some of those problems actually tripped me out, so I'm glad you you were here to help and Ruben too. Yeah. Yeah. No. It was, yeah. Because it, it was. It was. Uh, and you can thank Julia for that. Is uh, Julia's like, hey, we kind of told a lot of people about this. You might want to like give them some help. I'm like. Oh yeah, no, you're probably right. And I came like uh, like as soon as uh, I saw the amount, I'm like, yeah, we need help. Yeah. Did, did anyone, um, so did anyone cover the first system shift? Uh, yeah, Luna actually it was her first day today, so oh, she, okay. she's already on there. All right, cool. All right, well, yeah, dude. Well, awesome. you're off, so have a yeah. good night. And again, thank you so much. Yeah, you too, man. Have a good one. Peace out. Peace, dude.